to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The officers are the president, his father's over here at the far end. Uh, in the middle there. Uh, Teresa Chuber is our uh, <laughs> treasurer. <laughs> treasure. I'm the vice the president, and then our secretary right here is uh, uh, Debbie Blades, and that's the secretary here. Secretary. Yeah. Secretary. <laughs> Only when she when she's not here, he has to take notes, and he's not very good. No, I have to read the last one. Oh, you have the last one. <laughs> uh, We've got an agenda we'll talk about. Agenda will go over the agenda. Um, every year, every time we have a meeting, we have some of our books that are over there. If you have uh, one of those, where a grave is, or some of your family members, uh, that was done by the Historical Society in the past. We have those books. If you have a, uh, someone that's in was in the American Civil War uh, and he's from this county, we've got uh, records over here. So we've got a lot of research. For you, and we're reprinting those books as as we go. So if you want one, talk to Gene up here or Noah. He's not too late, uh, <laughs> and so he'll he'll try to get get some to you. At least not that maybe this meeting if we run out, or at least the next time. We have a guest speaker tonight, and I'm not going to introduce. I'm going to let uh, Gene do that. But we need to run the meeting first because we got a lot of stuff to to get out of the way because next month. Is the Victorian Mall. So I'm going to turn that turn it over to talk about the agenda. Well, we welcome everybody here. I think there's going to be a few more show up in a little bit. And a lot of people uh, stand in the public work, so we'll be here for the end for sure. But uh, we try to hold a meeting every month. We try to hold, we try to have a speaker every month. That way it keeps things interesting. Uh, our speaker tonight will find out he was actually born here in Rapid County. A lot of you guys may know that, but uh, he's a Lake County and he spent most of his years teaching history. So we'll have him speak here in a little bit. So uh, we'll start out with a reading the minutes from the October 10th meeting. Uh, minutes. Uh, October 10th, uh, the attendance was 29. Officers in attendance were Noah, David, Teresa, and myself. The meeting was called to order at 5 30. Meeting opened with the Pledge of Allegiance and a prayer led by Teresa Schubert. David Schubert spoke for a few minutes regarding our problems for the Raiders and a little bit about the group, its membership, and the need for everyone to pay their dues. The minutes of the September meeting were read and approved. David talked about upcoming events that would be known to the BFW, BFW, such as the State Dinner, etc. Noah Smothers announced that old books from the previous historical society were given to the library. David spoke about the plaques of appreciation that were given to longtime members of the historical society who have dedicated their time and service over many years. Teresa Schubert read the September Treasurer's Report, and the ending balance is currently $1,491.93. She reported that there were no expenditures at this time. The report was approved. Teresa also reiterated once again that everyone needs to make sure to pay their dues. Teresa talked about the upcoming Victorian Ball and announced that Triumph Trophy and Frog Green have agreed to sell tickets to the event from their locations. It was decided that the period for membership in the Historical Society would be from June to June. Noah showed our brochures and said that they show all of the upcoming events. He has been handing them out all over town. He also talked about the ice cream social held the previous weekend and said the turnout was just fair. David and Teresa set up a display for the Historical Society in the library in one of the display windows. Teresa mentioned possibly encouraging young people to get involved by having them do presentations as local figures of historical significance. Noah spoke a bit about, about having speakers at the meetings and told who some of the upcoming scheduled speakers will be over the next few months. He then introduced Pam Smith Peter Begley, whose family was one of the very first settlers in the Lafayette County. 
six, from 6 o'clock to 7.15, Pam Smith Peter Begley, along with her friend and assistant Kathleen Harbour Taser from the Lebanon Library Board, did a talk and slideshow about the Smith Peter family in Lebanon and from their beginnings in McLeod County. She had lots of pictures and artifacts that had been handed down over many generations. She spoke about her two times great grandparents, Alfred and Mary Smith Peter, who are married on opposite sides of I-44 and the story of how that came to occur. Her presentation was very informative and entertaining. She then answered some questions and walked around the room showing some of the original land deeds of her ancestors. A drawing was held at 7.30 for the donated items. The meeting was adjourned at 7.45. Yeah. Any to approve, uh, anybody that approved the minutes? Uh, Secretary, okay. The meetings are, minutes are approved. Well, we need a second. 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 Treasurer report. Okay. <clears throat> Last month we had 1,585.67. Uh, we had an admin fee of uh, uh, $9.74 and then $28.79. And we uh, had some plaques that we paid for to our historian people that have done a lot of work in the past uh, that we gave plaques to. And that was, we had an expenditure uh, to try and printing engraving for 168. And so that total pain is out $206.53 and with a ending balance of $1,379.14. Sure. So, uh, we need to bring it to a vote if you approve of the treasury. Approve of the treasury. <laughs> right. Right. And second. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Actually, this, probably like everybody else, this month has been crazy. There's so much going on, and it's hard to keep up with everything. But, uh, we just finished up two and a half hours of working at Commercial Street, passing out brochures and stuff about what we're trying to do. Uh, we have a news newsletter we printed up for October, uh, telling about what we have done in the past. It also talks about our hunt with the Boy Scouts. That we had a good time out here back to the DFW. You gave away a metal detector to a Boy Scout. Yeah, thank you. When we started this, we wanted to recognize all the people that was in the previous historical society. We do have a list of most of their names. Uh, I think the last list I got goes to 2016. And I think there's 78 people that was on the list at that time that were paid members. Some of them were lifetime members. Uh, we're going to recognize them lifetime members, so they will be part of our group. Uh, we're trying to piece and repair what happened in 2016 by doing this, by starting a whole new historical society. Uh, we're going around telling everybody we have nothing to do with the old one. Uh, I don't mean that we don't have anything to do with it, but, uh, but a lot of people that worked on the old historical society did a lot of work. They did a lot of they worked. They went out and they researched the cemeteries. They wrote books. They did uh, the radio obituaries in the newspaper. Uh, so we started out. We presented uh, Charlene Hopkins with a plaque. Mm -hmm. you know, many of you may not know Charlene's 95 years old. She is on hospice, mm -hmm. but she uh, she done a tremendous amount of work for the old historical society, and uh, she still. She'll still sit on her couch and talk to you about the old things that happened in Lebanon, just like it was yesterday. But she does have quite a bit of health issues. But she's, uh, she's been a, a great help to us. Me and my wife actually went to church with Charlene down at Washington Christian Church when she could go years ago. 
So we've known her for a long time, but we actually presented her with one of our plaques. Another one we presented to Judith Cunningham. Judith has a tremendous amount of work she's done on the obituaries for the Fleet County. She's still working on them. Uh, she's actually got five more books that she's not even published yet. Uh, they've not been sent to the printers, but if you go talk to her, with that she'll show them to her on her kitchen table, and she, some of them's about that thick. So I can tell you, she's done a tremendous amount of work. It'll be a valuable asset to to people doing genealogy, and also people doing historical research for the county. Getting back to that, our, our goal is to one time bring this genealogical society and the historical society back together. They both deal with history. And I think it would be to the benefit if we could work together and maybe have a researcher and put in our new ones in when we get one, where somebody wanted to come in and maybe their ancestors lived here and they live in California, they want to come back and do research where they could come in and enjoy it and sit down and do research on their family. Uh, another one is Betsy Scoby. Betsy Scoby and Charlene went out and they'll tell you a funny old story about they went out to a cemetery one time and Charlene took off running across the cemetery and she disappeared. So where's Charlene at? What's, what's going on? She actually fell in a grave. Oh <laughs> <my>. <laughs> the grass was slick and she just slid down and you know sometimes the grass was slick. <laughs> Charlene ended down in the gravesite. So I can tell you about many stories about going out and fighting the ticks, the bugs, the mosquitoes, the dogs, the, and whatever. But they spent hours and hours, don't tell them how many days and hours they've spent going out and researching the old cemetery. They're not all complete. Mm -hmm. Like any cemetery, there's usually some people that don't have any workers. They may not even had an obituary put in the newspaper because they couldn't afford it. Uh, but anyhow, what research they have done will be a tremendous amount to, for people to look at. The other one is for Kirk Pierce. Many of you probably know Kirk Pierce. He's a local historian who works in the newspaper office. I think he's on his 50th year, pretty close, or something like that he is. Talking about trying to maybe retire. <laughs> but Kirk has produced a lot of articles in our local newspapers about the history in the Pete County. Uh, we don't know yet, but uh, he says he's really thinking about that retirement. So, but when you want to know anything, he's one of the know God guys to go to. He, uh, him and Donnie Rafe sitting over here, Donnie has put together a four hour video, I guess, of the old buildings and pictures and talks about the things in town. I'd like to get him to come in in the spring here and, and talk to us and show us his work. But him and uh, Kirk have been working together probably, uh, probably all their lives, I would assume, pretty close to them. We also, uh, Connie Morgan, Tony Morgan worked with Betsy and Charlene and went out and researched the cemetery. The time is no longer with us, but we wanted to recognize the fact that uh, that she did did the work, and we presented the plaque to Ashley Maytan, which is our favorite Congress president. She was a niece of Connie, and Ashley was going to pass it on to Connie's daughter. So. So these people are just some of the people that worked with the old historical society before. And of course, some of them are not here with us any longer. Some of them have passed away. But I think it started in, I believe, 1978. It started many, many years ago. And they had a, a tremendous following. And they had lots of people that helped. But over the years, it got to the point where it just kind of, the people got older, some of them didn't want to do it anymore. The younger people, they couldn't get to come in and help work these, the old museum and the jailhouse and, 
And so it got to the point where this kind of collapsed, I guess you would say. We are to the point, though, that it's been six years. We're finding out that people are still interested in history. We don't have any stagecoach robberies. We don't have a Jesse James story to tell. We do know that supposedly they came through the Fleet County a couple times. We don't really have any major Civil War battles. We know that both armies occupied Lecleave or, or Lebanon at different times. But we still have history, and it's because of the pioneers that came in here and raised their families and, and settled. And, and a lot of the people here in Lecleave County and Lebanon are their descendants. Uh, not long ago, I seen a show on TV that some actor out in California was researching his family. And for life of me, I can't remember the name of it, but his second great grandfather was born and raised right up there at Avo in Laclede County. This guy's family went all the way back, they traced it back, I forgot how many generations, to way over in England and kings and queens and all of that. But yet, his family had ties right here to the county that we're in. There's people all over the country like that. Uh, our Facebook group is up to almost 550 people. A lot of them don't live here anymore. A lot of them might have attended school and left. A lot of them, their parents or grandparents might have been here, but they moved on and went on to different places. But it's interesting to talk to people, they, they love to find out about their families. In fact, we just talked to a young lady over at Galleria just a little bit ago. She, uh, <laughs> she is just, you know, she just involved that we are doing this. Uh, there is young people out there. We talked to a young lady just a little bit ago that's really interested in our Victorian dance. She's a senior after the high school. So the younger generations, they may be more interested in what we realized. Uh, they actually may be, uh, and it seems to me like when I go around and talk to these businesses, some of them do have young people working in the business. They're usually a, a receptionist or a secretary or somebody that's in the front door. But a lot of times when I'm handling this newsletter, the first thing they do, they start reading. <laughs> and, uh, and when they say the younger generation's not interested, that's, that's not correct. So when that young girl or that young guy sitting there reading this newspaper, they're looking for history, they're looking for information. And that's what we're all about. The other thing was we want to recognize people that's helping us. Uh, we presented a plaque to Kelly Travis. Kelly is the owner of the Frog Printing down here. She's basically printed everything up at her cost. It's not costing us anything. I mean, it does, but not like it would if she had to charge us to be a repeated customer. Uh, so people like that's got to support us and help us. And that's what we're going to have to have, too, is uh, people that come in and join up, pay their dues, and, and they also uh, trying to help us in our efforts. Also, a lot of people may not know this, but there is a museum in all of the counties surrounding Lebanon, except for us. We don't have a museum. There's one in Camden, there's one in Marshfield, there's one down at uh, Wright County, there's one in Pulaski County. The people in Pulaski County, the newspaper I'm passing around is how they raise most of their funds it's just through that newspaper. They print it out one time a year, they give it away free, but they're making their money by the advertisers that buy advertising in it. And so all of their their uh, whole society is based basically on the funds they make off that one newspaper. They generally make about $20,000 a year, which is a pretty good chunk of money to go back to pay expenses. And that's the Stagecoach Society over there. And they sent us a donation uh, a while back, I don't remember, not too far back, but uh, $500, which I thought was, you know, that's pretty outstanding. We got a county that's not, people that's not even in our county helping us. So uh, 
Fourth Amendment County has helped us write our bylaws with our Constitution. Yes, okay. Uh, they helped like, write our bylaws and our Constitution so we could get our tax papers and stuff done through the state. And so, so we, we received help from them, too. Uh, the BFW is helping us. Their normal charge for this room is $200. They're actually David as a veteran. We've got more veterans that come up with us. But they're yeah, yeah, he's one of them old Navy guys. That's right. I think he was in the Air Force. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> but anyhow, they're letting us rent this building for free, which is an asset to us. Because we don't have a building at the moment, and even though we're working on it, we have been out looking and, and talking and, and talking to some of the business owners and stuff. Uh, I guess everybody pretty well knows that commercial streets, basically, there's hardly any empty buildings on it. The ones that are building, we couldn't afford to pay the rent or the insurance of the utilities on it. So we're, but we're trying, we're working. Uh, I think the next thing, well, we have, we'll talk about the Victorian Ball, and uh, David's going to, he's the chairman of the Victorian Ball, he's had experience doing this before, him and his wife, Teresa. <laughs> we went, the big thing we didn't know was how to be, would there be any interested in Victorian Ball? Most people don't know who Queen Victoria is unless you watch uh, Judge Roy B. And, uh, and we talked about, but a lot of people really thought she was as equal to Queen Elizabeth, the same uh, reign. She had one of the longest reigns from uh, 38, 1838 or 37 to 1901. And a lot of people, even in America, really thought really well of her and thought she did a great job, not only for the, the laborers, for the workers, also the Irish. She passed, got a lot of uh, social uh, things that were passed, and her husband was very big in, in, into uh, science and technology. So between that, uh, we thought we, we would sort of look at how we've done that. We, we've done these before. Um, usually it's a small group. It may be small this time, we, although I'm going to tell you all the places we advertise, hopefully it improves that way. But in any case, uh, we had maybe 40 the first time, and we had a string band, and we had a photographer. And next year, we did the same thing. It went from 40 to 75, and the next year, it was closer to 100. So most people were all worried about, how do we dance? Well, if you go look on uh, YouTube, it's all over the place. Just look up Victorian dancing, and you, you can learn how to do it. Or you can come the day of the Victorian ball, and they'll be given dance instruction. Most guys are thinking, oh, no. I don't know how to dance. I got two left. Okay. If I can dance, but I, I can get out there. Okay. And I can look funny just like Brett. So, uh, in any case, you're there to, this is really a fundraiser, but it's also a fun thing. Most people, has anybody ever been to a Victoria Ball? No. So, this will be all new, all you need. The music will be unique too. But I think you you really understand a lot of the music at that time time frame, and the way they dance is it's sort of like a slow western line dance. Yeah, it's of. like a waltz and a grand march and more like there's a caller, and it's, uh, to me I relate it more to a square dance. Yeah, sure. So that was we sort of did this as a fundraiser. We didn't, I had no idea if people would be interested in who wanted to get out of their comfort zone into a box with a bunch of people with long dresses and top hats and games. Um, it's, it is fun. You were like, we started with advertising this year with the newspaper with the leader and the community calendar. Old stage, uh, stagecoach stop, yearly magazine, it should be in there. The tracker or the trader weekly paper, the historical newsletter, Fort Leonard Wood guide on paper. Which is uh, it's an e-paper now. Uh, show me advertising uh, out there by uh, by the Pizza Hut. As you go into Walmart, you'll see it out there. You gotta you gotta stop the Pizza Hut and look up and read it because it goes too fast. Uh, 
uh, hand out to the sheriff's department, the police department, fire department. You know, I, we, if they, they've got the uniforms, they'll dress up. Plato School, Lebanon School uh, teachers, Eric's going to take some stuff out. I, Teresa and I walk to every place in the engineer school, the MP school, the chemical school, the in bathrooms. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good place. Everybody's going to go there. Yeah, infused bank. I got on KY3 this weekend. Uh, they said by the time they had to get to it, it'd be this kind of weekend. Uh, BFW uh, bulletin board, info flyer. I just talked to Jake, and for those guys that are in the uh, treasure trackers, he said we can have the 14 for a Christmas party. I contacted Wilson Creek, dropped stuff off for them, uh, for the park rangers, and then we've all walked miles. <laughs> And for the le uh, local <laughs> businesses here, we're looking for donations. Um, and you can see, I'm going to let Teresa talk a little bit about her, but we need donations. We're going to do a silent auction. Um, if it's canned goods, or it's a deer horn um, basket, or it's prints, or it's artifacts from historical artifacts that somebody's got, or something they just don't, don't want in their home or they want to write this off, because it is, uh, we are. Uh, 50C31 32. Okay, I'm glad you got that. So, we'd like to do that. Everybody will have a chance to get some. I know, uh, as I said last time, we got some, uh, we got some oil paintings, we got some uh, sign prints. So, uh, and it's uh, some of them are related to Missouri. So, I think that's, uh, uh, oh, yep, and we've got uh, David Smothers. He did an oil painting of Osage Indian in a canoe with a bear. And that was originally was, we thought we were going to do that as our as our logo. Um, and he's done that that it's really an old old man. Is that correct? Okay, so we'll have that there. Uh, we have uh, the flower shop is going, they want to take our little lanterns and they're going to decorate them. So I'm going to take them and drop them off. We talked with them today. Uh bandanas, I still need to go by. They're going to donate uh, Six or seven bottles of barbecue sauce, juice, coffee. I got to go back and see them. Mail's restaurant. The name of the neighborhood. They said they donated a free meal. He was. He went there. Okay. And the pink Z. Uh, is it my name? The pink Z. I was wondering that too. <laughs> That's yeah. that girl that works with Kelly at the printer. Oh, okay. All right. She donated one of the oil defusers where you put the oil mm -hmm. in there and it's got the reeds in it. Is this the one you spoke? No, no, no. <laughs> we got two minutes on the phone. It's not. It's not. So, I would like for everybody that's a member or to pass out the information. We have flyers over there. We have the newsletter over there. If you have somebody that would like to, maybe your husband doesn't want to come to the dance because he doesn't think he's got two left feet or he does have two left feet, then you can ask your next door neighbor. Or her husband, or somebody else. <laughs> Either way, please advertise, work it out, pass that information out. We have it over here. We'd like to have good people that are interested in the history or want to dance, whatever, be out of the box because most people don't know how to do this, but they will, and you can come to the dance lessons. And uh, the one thing that's on the back of all the flyers here is the photographer. The photographer has a camera. And stuff. 150 years old, it only takes photos on 10. So you got to stand there, don't move, take the film off, take it off the lens, take it off for three seconds, put it back, and then you can be able to look at your photo. That is the exact process they did 150 years ago. Other than they did some on 10, some on glass, sure. glass broke, 10 minutes, and they kept it. And we'll still have that. Teresa, were you talking a little bit about the, uh, the, uh, Auction there with some of the things you got. So we're going to have a silent auction. It'll be going on during the dance. Uh, but I just I did a, an example of something that you can do to donate, and this is all different things from my garden, and then um, a suit mix. And I got that bag at um, Dollar Tree, and just any type of basket will do. This is the baskets that I made. It's not finished. This is my artwork. Uh, but 
that I started putting deer antlers, incorporating deer antlers into my baskets. Uh, and I'm going to have this a little bit empty because mine is just, it'll be in the, the silent auction. So, and then a lot of you ladies have been asking me about hair pieces and stuff for the dance. I just went to the dollar store and got a headband and some flowers. And you really don't need a snoop. You just, for a ball, you can just make one of these little things, put your hair up, and you've got a, a very appropriate hair piece. And so that's what, anything else? What? Right. Didn't you talk to the lady at Talents? She said she had. Uh, oh, yeah. the lady at Kelly's has. Um, she said she has hoops too that she will load for the ball. So if any of you have a dress and you need a hoop to go in underneath it, she has uh, two that she will load. And then when we were in Tennessee, I picked one up at a, a second hand store, an antique store for eight bucks so and Jean, was it you that said that you met somebody from the second hand clothing store act two. act two downtown and the lady told noah she's like oh we have lots of men's jackets and vests here so look at your second hand shops for for vests and things and, and patronize our businesses and love it and so I'm gonna, I'm done. I'm gonna make it short because I'm interested in our speaking. <laughs> uh, the only other thing is um, you talked about. Oh, you did talk about Cali, and um, and like I said, lastly, um, if you have some, if you interested in joining tonight, um, we can, you can talk to the the treasurer there and join the club um, and get in on it. And then also, if you want to pay for your Victorian ball tickets. She has them here, um, and it's it's two dollars two dollars fifty cents cheaper buying it now than it is the day of. So that's not a whole big thing. I'm not sure. You can but we have flowers over there. Please pass them out to your friends and uh, and compadres, and we sure appreciate it. Uh, help advertise for the Victorian ball, and it will start at seven. We'll have it open here at seven, and then. The music will start at 7.30. Uh, the silent auction will be right over there. You can walk over there and put your bid on any one of those items anytime during the night. And before the night, so about 9.30, we'll, uh, we'll announce the winners of the silent auction. And again, the funding goes to to us, the Boy Scouts, the BFF, and the band. Mm -hmm. uh, well, and then the, the 10 types she is a charge on her own. Yeah, she'll be in that room back there in the back, which is a, oh, most people don't know that that is a room that was originally uh, for Leonard Wood Barracks, or was it an office from the old uh, barracks over there, and it's still decorated. She'll put up a flyer in there. You can walk back in there, and she'll have her camera, and you can do that anytime when you get tired of dancing or getting stuck on. She will not be furnishing clothes. We talked to a Ken type person that does that, and they their minimum charge was over two thousand dollars. So, uh, but what we're going to do is David and Teresa have some extra clothes. They have some old Civil War vests, I think, and stuff yeah, like that. Coats and some hats. But also, the people that do have that will more than likely. Let you wear their vest or their tie or whatever, so you can have your picture taken. And, and uh, so it's just a time to have fun. That's all it's going to be. Uh, we're not going to laugh at Greg if you don't. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, don't you don't have to have. You, we just want you to come in clothes and have fun. We in don't, clothes, we, yeah. we, we, don't care what, more, <laughs> we don't care what they are. They are just come and enjoy. Uh, the Victorian dance, well, how does that relate to the history of the county? They did it. Mm -hmm. they, they had dances in their in their front yard over there on Harwood Drive. Uh, they had gatherings. They had picnics. Uh, it's something that they would have, the pioneers would have done too. 
I mean, it's not like, a, and, and the poor people probably had one change of clothes. Uh, probably their shirts might have been patched. Uh, and they, they traded for tickets too. They would bring food and trade that for a ticket. And there was two uh, organizations that were run by females. They, they were, I almost call them fraternal organizations. And they did one in the spring and one in the fall. And they tried to see who had the best one. So, so it's something that they would have done, and that's what we're trying to do. We're, we have several more events that we're working on that uh, will be in the spring. Uh, I, you know, we could have a list of things. But, uh, Oh, okay. Yeah. You say that, I'm going to put this Okay. All right. I just thought that the Friday we're going to be able to have the place and come in and um, do some cleaning and decorating. And so Friday is the first, Saturday is the ball. Uh, but if you're not working or can get off, I need some people to help me. I think Julie's already volunteered. Pat's going to get out of work. And <laughs> Pat's going to see if she She's going to be a Walmart anyway. Yeah. <laughs> you can call her if you want to volunteer to help decorate, and she'll appreciate it. And then her have her phone number up here. And we'll, we'll put that together. And if you're going to bring um, a basket or something like that, please come and tell us. And we, we, uh, We'll make sure we've got that. Yeah, because part of that being the silent auction, I'm going to have to have whatever we're getting, our baskets are, or whatever we're donating, we'll have to have the donation sheet on it and what it is at the top. And then during the ball, when you get a chance and you want something, you go over and write your name on there and what you want to donate is how that goes. And then the top bidder at the end of the evening. Uh, then that goes to them. And the money goes to our historical society and in our little account. So one day maybe we can have a museum. And and that being said, if you know of anybody that's like really, you know, it's like give a car uh, away, give a, a property away, if you know somebody that just have, has a building that would like uh, a tax write-off, we were willing to look at it really closely. And uh, I think that would be great to have a museum here in Lebanon. Uh, Teresa, I know we all worked in, in the in the library and we saw where the, all the, the artifacts the, and all, all the things that we've seen has jammed inside the library behind the walls and in storage and they need a lot of help, but it's your families, your uh, a lot of this, a lot of the things that uh, that come from our families here in Lafayette County is just in storage now, and it's been in storage for a long time. Some of the future events and programs we're looking at is in the spring we'd like to do a military vehicles club show. And they can talk about that because we. Uh, we want to invite vendors to come in here and sell the military items uh, and things like that. So we would uh, like rent so much a table. Mm -hmm. uh, we would have the guys bring their jet tanks. Yeah, our tanks, that's what we need. It's a small time. <laughs> <laughs> but, but we're looking at that too. The VFW is really helping us. They've been a tremendous amount of help to us. So. Uh, the other one is a historical costume party. Halloween. Uh, that uh, you could drive, you could actually dress up as Abraham Lincoln. And we're not tall enough for that. Blackbeard Pop. Blackbeard Pop. Oh. But uh, another big one we're talking about is Lost Arts in the, Arts in the Park. Now, everybody knows we used to have some of the February days around here. It's a thing of the past. Uh, it's not kosher to say you really anymore, I guess. But, uh, <laughs> but this Lost Arts in the Park, we have contacted a lot of people more interested in coming here and doing that for us. Uh, 
and they would uh, set up, you know, where they might make the old soap, like uh, Pine Ridge used to do. They could make the baskets like we were just talking about. Uh, we'll have a blacksmith. We're looking at somebody that, that even could do guns. Yep, he makes uh, guns. Makes guns, knives. Like a, like uh, so, so that's something we're looking at, too. Also an antique auction. We're uh, thinking about the historical society. I'm sure that uh, there's things that uh, people want to donate to us, but we don't really need it. Uh, and what I'm talking about there is we might have somebody give us 1,500 World War One helmets. We only need one for a display. We don't need 14, 1,499 more of them. So, so things like that would be something that we we do have read up in our written in our bylaws how we would handle that. The old historical society had the problem with people leaving stuff on their doorstep and not saying where it came from, why it was there. Uh, I'm sure that we're going to run into things like that. We've also we've had two ice cream socials already. Uh, Gary Lee, maybe some of you know Gary and Sally Lee, but Gary's got a five five gallon ice cream maker and a, on an old uh, uh, steel box, box. or uh, wood box. John Deere, yeah. uh, two side, two side. Yeah. But Gary comes in and makes our ice cream for us, and when we have a meeting, we usually have it at town. We had one on the courthouse, and then we had one behind the uh, newspaper office. We had a really good time there. Uh, it seems like a lot of times when we do things, like tonight, there's a guy speaking at the library tonight, so sometimes we have conflict of things going on. <laughs> Ours is better. We've had a lot of discussion that the women are really talking about a World War II swing dance. Now, <laughs> we're trying to pick a dance, but even today, people brought it up, you know, well, what about swing dance? Well, that's a possibility. That's something else that we could do. You think we can get ready to start that meeting? Get ready to get a broken dance. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we have, we're also discussing the black powder shoot. Uh, that might be something, Sam Mustard might be interested in doing something like that. That's our former chief of police sitting over there. Uh, I don't know if he shoots black powder, but he might not. I've got one. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> it's ready to go. Oh, that's yeah, yeah, that's right. It's it's ready to go. You're picking it up tomorrow. But we got one thing I want to make sure you. Okay. Uh, speaking of that, uh, not long ago, this young lady here in Berkeley County found what she thought was a cannonball from the Civil War. That thing ended up being blown up by either the police department or the sheriff's department. We're not sure, but they don't know where it went to. Because it's a solid, it's a yeah. solid shot. Yeah. There's a solid shot. So when they blew it up, it disappeared. They don't know if it went up that way or oh, went down in the ground. They can't find it. They don't know where it went to. It's in somebody's <laughs> backyard. <laughs> I bet you that's a good yeah. idea. <laughs> but, but that was an interesting day there. So uh, we actually ended up with the bomb squad from the Fort Leonard with it. Uh, we ended up with the highway patrol, the sheriff's department, the police department, and the poor little girl lost her solid iron ball. <laughs> uh, she caught be a shot, but, yeah. <laughs> but we're hoping someday, most of it, a lot of us are in the metal detecting, so we're hoping someday we can find another one and give it back to her because, because it would have been a memory for her. Uh, so that's the sum of the things we're looking at. Uh, David and Teresa do 1850s medical surgery herbal medicine that they've done for years. So they, uh, we actually did that out at uh, one of the lawyers that was wounded. Yeah. Uh, they were sort of wounded after we got those. One guy lost But I think we've got most of our. Uh, business taken care of right now so we're going to turn it over to our speaker i uh 
I hadn't met Ross. I'd seen him quite often on the uh, uh, the website, the Facebook. He posts on there about two times a day, I think, in the morning. At least right? one. Yeah. He's got to be a fast typist because he he uh, he goes by the date and the year of the history that happened in Missouri. Mm -hmm. uh, he's actually written 19 books, I believe, on the Missouri history. He's a retired uh, school teacher. Uh, He's well known. In fact, on his website, it says that he's one of the top 50 Missourians that everybody should know. So, so we're honored to have him come and speak to us tonight, and uh, glad he could come and, and present to us. Okay. Yeah. And that wasn't me that said I was one of those guys that everybody should know. That that was amazing. <laughs> Um, it's nice to see all the faces here. I'm going to try to talk to you all here. Without, can you hear me okay? Um, some of the faces I recognize, Sam, I just, just now recognize you. Um, of course, when I remember you best, you were a little guy with thick, wavy hair. Yeah. That was a nice And there are some people I could tell stories on here from back to my other life when I was younger and thinner. But uh, if I start telling stories, then Don or Gilbert or somebody can start telling <laughs> stories too. So, <laughs> so, But it's nice to be able to be here. I appreciate it. I enjoyed my life in Cleveland County when I grew up here. Uh, I really felt like I had about as close to a Tom Sawyer life as anybody could. Um, we rode our, our bikes out to your place a lot, didn't we? Yeah. And, and uh, we just rode it. We had what we called bike hikes all over the area. And um, it was just a wonderful life. And the people around in the countryside or wherever we went were so good about, you know, letting us drink from their pump or their well and letting us uh, sometimes bring out cold lemonade when we were out riding those bikes or, or um, give us cookies or whatever. I mean, it was great. But, and we were always so safe, we just never felt that we weren't. And that I don't know if that's really different now, but it sure perceives it different. But anyway, I hope you get to talk with all of you. I had kind of a rough day, so I had no one to talk to today. Um, been in the car doors all day. And she's mad at me. I guess I'm going to tell you why. She uh, she hadn't been sleeping well the last several nights, and she's upset because I've been sleeping like a baby. And by that, I mean I cry a lot and I kick off the covers and run <laughs> so, uh, uh, so I, I can kind of understand. I wanted to mention before I really get started, um, every day on Facebook, I do post this day in Missouri history. Usually have photos, always have photos with it. If, if you don't receive that in the morning, it uh, goes real well with coffee, and all you have to do is go to this uh, what, you know, Ross Malone, Missouri writer on Facebook. I've got cards over here to remind you that if you want to stop and pick one up. And if you want to contact me for anything else, I have these cards, and on the back is my contact information. Um, so I'm going to try to go pretty quick here and keep this down to two hours. <laughs> um, the, the stories I want to share with you tonight, basically most of them come from these two books. A couple of them come from this one. But uh, I, I think I'm going to share one more thing with you before I start. Kind of early in my teaching career, I was teaching science, math, and social studies, which uh, was Missouri history. And I was trying to think about what do I, what what can I do to make the learning stick uh, to increase retention. And I was trying to remember what do I remember from school. You know, what did my teachers teach me that I can actually remember? And it was strange. Mrs. Rubel, I don't know if anyone remembers Mrs. Rubel, who taught world history. Mm -hmm. And um, she taught me that um, Mark Anthony and Cleopatra had a contest once where they were trying to see who could consume the most expensive meal. And she dissolved some pearls in vinegar and took a sip and won the contest. Well, isn't that a stupid thing to remember? <laughs> and and at, uh, up at the university, we had a naval history professor who would be teaching along, and he'd stop and he'd say, uh, "War story." 
Mm -hmm. And he'd tell about an experience of his that tied in with our lesson. Now, a lot of times they weren't war stories at all. They were just his time in the service. But the thing is, it kind of hit me. The best teachers use stories to increase your tension. Jesus taught with parables. He saw taught with fables. Um, Shakespeare, his great stories, and remember the detail. I remember studying Shakespeare over at the high school, and I thought, I don't want to do this. I'm not interested in Shakespeare. And we started reading um, Julius Caesar. And I hear this stuff all the time. Every day I hear people saying these things, and that's where it came from. So anyway, stories have a great effect. So I've been collecting the stories about Missouri and about science for many, many years. And um, I, as I retired, uh, I ended up using these stories in my writing and all. So uh, we're going to get right into this. Um, one of the first uh, <laughs> group that I came across when I was starting to point stories was a group from Cassville, Missouri. And they're called the All American Redheads. And they were basketball players. They weren't all redheads at first, but the couple that really owned the team, uh, the lady ran a beauty shop. And she would hire these girls who were good basketball players and let them, you know, that way they had some income other than just what they could scrape together playing basketball around the country. Well, they did end up touring the country. They were recognized as very, very good. They would come to towns of all different sizes. Um, they would play the local men's all-star team, and they would win, and win, and win, and win. They were really, really good. They played by men's rules, which were different back then. Uh, this lady here, and by the way, they didn't always travel in the woods. They ended up traveling much better uh, style than that. Uh, this lady was designated as their comedian, and so uh, she was just supposed to clown around, be a metal arc lemon type character. She's supposed to clown around during the games. And so one in one game, she was foul, sent to the foul line, shoot the free throw. And um, she decided, since I'm clowning around, she's got down on her knees, took a shot, zip right through. And uh, next time she shot from her knees again, nothing but net, straight through. And so the next time people were saying, shoot from your knees, from your knees, you know, so she did. And her, uh, they probably put it in the papers in the, you know, advertising for the coming games. But anyway, when she went from town to town, people asked her, expected her to shoot from her knees. And she did 100 shots straight without missing from her knees. She's pretty good. And, uh, she had, at 100, she said, I'm going to quit while I've got this record. <laughs> you know, <laughs> this is good. I'll, I'll live with this. Uh, they uh, they did travel around and play lots of games. They, somebody said they're not the all the uh, Harlem Globetrotters, and they were a lot. Except when they played the Harlem Globetrotters, they beat the Harlem Globetrotters. Mm -hmm. wow. So they were very, very good. And I mentioned they weren't all redheads, but a couple of their star players were, so soon they all became redheads. <laughs> And then they got so well known, they started uh, attracting some All American players to come and play on their team. And they became the All American Redheads. One of the most interesting things about them, they had just won 96 games in a row, and they left the country to go on a world tour. And uh, while they were in the Philippines, they had just arrived when Japan attacked, and they were stuck. Everybody who had connections got out. They had no connections. So they ended up, they divided up into twos and threes, and they got on cattle boats or just anything that floated and got away, and they all eventually met up again in Guam. But uh, had, had a very interesting life, and they are in the uh, Basketball Hall of Fame. But most people have forgotten about them, even here in Missouri. Not in Cassville, though, right, Doris? Right. Well, they know them. <laughs> Good. I never say, well, my aunt was on that team, right? Yeah, you know, they're very well known down there. Here's one of my favorite characters I ever found out about. His name was Phelan O'Toole. He was an Irish immigrant and uh, came to America. I don't know if he was a cabin boy on a ship, but somehow he got to St. Louis. And he got really lucky in a time when they had those 
Irish need not apply signs up, you know, and uh, he got a job, and it was a good job at the St. Louis Fire Department, and it turned out he was a genius at rescuing people. When nobody else could figure a way, he could, and uh, he became really well known for that. This was the most famous incident, and this is where he really came to recognition. This was the biggest building in St. Louis at the time, the Southern Hotel, and it was new, and they had something new called elevators, and that meant an elevator shaft. Well, elevator shafts were more than one. And anyway, when this fire caught on the lower floors, it went right up those shafts and spread to the upper floor and went so fast. And what I'm going to tell you, it sounds like it couldn't be true. But it was witnessed by thousands. People thought they were going to see people burn and perish in that fire. But they don't know too. Oh, here's the reason they thought that. I'm sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself. He was the foreman of a hook and ladder truck, like I showed you in that first picture. They called it a truck, but it was horse drawn. And uh, that was him. He was uh, he was foreman of that truck. He's the guy on the far left. And anyway, that ladder would go up five stories. This building six stories. All the people on the top floor were absolutely trapped. But Fatal Motul says, I think I got an idea. He wrapped his big rope coiled around his body over his shoulder, climbed up one of the ladders as far as he could. As he was on his way up, he was yelling to the people, tie bed sheets together, hang them out the windows. And they did. And when he got up there, he uh, you know, got that rope, I suppose, and tied it around himself, and he went swinging like a pendulum from his ladder over until he could reach a bed sheet, grabbed it, climbed up, got a young woman, carried her down the sheet, went swinging back to the ladder, carried her down the ladder, and when she was safe on the ground, he went back up and got another one. He did that 12 times. He rescued 12 people that day. It seems impossible, but it happened. Well, you know, well documented and witnessed by thousands. And um, so right after that, they uh, had a special observation for him and they observance for him as well. He um, had this portrait painted that day. They, that was one of the things they did. They gave him that medal that he's wearing and they gave him a check for $750, which was huge back then. And he knew what he wanted to do with that money. He turned it over, signed the you know, endorsed the back of the check and handed it to the head of the mortgage. Just a great guy. So, anyway, oh, you know, under the Oakway Arch, there's the courthouse that has the green copper dome on the top, you know. That was on fire once, up in the dome. No way to reach it. And he went up on, along out the outside of the dome, chopped his way through this fire axe. Somehow, I don't know how to get it, they swung down through that hole in the chop. And, and control the hose and put the fire out while it's dangling there in the air. And that's the reason that the old courthouse is still there today in St. Louis, one of the state's great landmarks. But anyway, really super neat guy, super here. Uh, here's one, almost nobody recognizes Harold G. Schreier's name, but he was a, uh, in the Marines. He, and during World War II, went to various islands that were occupied by the Japanese sometimes by submarine and other times other other ways you know small craft of some kind but he would go on the island and then sneak around you know reconnoiter find out what he could about their troop strength and their uh, artillery whatever he could find out and then at a set time he would meet up with his ride and get back to tell everyone uh, you know in the intelligence what he had learned and I mean, what a dangerous job. That, that's what he did until they got to Okinawa. And there he had a squad of men that he was in charge of. And uh, he was a lieutenant at this time. And the, uh, his commander said, looks like we're gonna take this island. We need to do something to you know, make that known. And so he said, here's a flag. And I want you to climb up to the top of Mount Sirabaji and plant that flag. Well, Harold Schreier was the lieutenant in charge of that group. 
he is not one who was actually holding the flag in the famous photo. He was their boss. He was, he was standing, standing there with him. But um, he grew up in Quarters, Missouri, and went to school in Lexington. Quarters, right by Lexington. And uh, so people up there know about Harold Schreier, but he's a forgotten hero to most of us. By the way, he, he uh, raised a flag over Iwo Jima three times. Once was the first time, of course, and then this time when the, the guys who asked him to put the flag up sent him back up and said, want a bigger flag, right? Put up a bigger flag. And then the third time was when John Wayne made the movie, The Sands of Iwo Jima. He asked Trier to go up with him and, and uh, you know, be up there to represent everybody. Uh, we've looked for him in the movie, haven't been able to spot him, but he was there. And so anyway, another forgotten hero from Missouri. <coughs> Sacred Son grew up um, kind, of, kind of close to where Arrow Rock is now. And she was the daughter of a chief, beautiful woman, uh, very personable. And one day a Frenchman came, Delaney, I believe was his name, sounds Irish, but he said he was French. And uh, he had an idea to take a bunch of the Osage over to Europe and meet you know, the people of Europe, because they were so fascinated with the American Indians. And so he, he recruited several of them, including her and her husband, I think he was named Black Road. And uh, away they went, and they literally dined in the best hotels, and they dined with royalty, and they stayed, you know, all the accommodations were the best. Everywhere they went, they were treated like royalty, in the way they were. But then this Duane character was having trouble paying those expensive bills that he was building up. And he just skipped out. And he left them all there. And they didn't know what to do. So they tried to do what he had done and go ahead and you know sort of go on with the show. But they didn't really know how to do that. And they really fell on hard times. And they were having trouble finding even food, let alone the best, just any food at all. And it ended up, and this is kind of, I guess this might be controversial, but while they were there, she gave birth to twins. And she had to sell one of the twins. And that's why in this portrait, she only has one son. She had two. But uh, she sold to a very nice family knowing that that child would always have the best of everything but she would also have some herself she'd have one of her own children and so um, they they still didn't know what they were going to do they had no money they couldn't buy food or anything else uh, the marquis de lafayette the great revolutionary war hero was in france he heard about them and he agreed to pay their uh, passage to get on the ship back to the states and uh, when they got back, I believe they arrived in Norfolk and then were called to Washington, D.C. And this that's when this portrait was painted. The National Portrait Artist painted that and put it in the National Gallery. And uh, then she couldn't wait to get back home to Missouri, though. Back to her family. Oh, her husband died aboard the ship coming back. And so she, she was really on her own. But she, wanted to get back to the Osage village that she was from in Missouri. And uh, she got back and found out all the Osage were gone. Yeah, had been sent west. So quite a, quite a life. Um, you know, I don't know if she would have left him if she had a choice. But this, this book about forgotten heroes, it's all about making choices. And, you know, there are results, not all the good results. But I don't know if she, if she had it to go over, she'd give up that child. I don't know. Um, I'm going to kind of skip over W.T. Vernon because even though I might talk about him more in some places, you feel all. And by the way, I enjoy being in a place where people are interested in history and know history. So uh, you probably know more about W.T. Vernon than I do. But of course, he was from Lebanon, son of slaves, um, became a U.S. ambassador, university president, college president. He uh, was the registrar of the treasury, and you can see. I've circled in white down there. That's W.T. Vernon. His signature was on all of our money for a while. So, um, 
Vernon School here, but you, you know about him. But how about Kennelly, Jacob Kennelly? I went to school here. You know, I, I knew people, but I didn't know Jacob Kennelly. I know there's Kennelly Street, but are, are you all familiar with his life and what he did? Well, okay, he was very much like Vernon in a way, son of slaves. Um, his father managed to buy a big farm, but there wasn't a school nearby. And um, a woman on a nearby farm had been teaching Jacob. He, he had a passion for learning. And uh, but after a while, she said, I can't teach him anymore. So he and his sister uh, got a room in Lebanon and um, went to school here. It, I don't think the room was heated. And they had a terrible time of it in the cold weather. And she eventually died uh, because of the, the exposure to all of the elements and walking yeah. to school and all that. But um, he, he survived. He went on. And he ended up, here's, he went from Lebanon to St. Louis, where he uh, went to the Sean High School. And he had to leave at about 3 o'clock each morning, even in the winter, talking about the cold. He had to leave about 3 in the morning to walk to school and get there on time because he couldn't find a place close enough. Sean was in a nice neighborhood, and he just couldn't afford anything in a nice neighborhood. So uh, he was there walking to school. He said every policeman in town knew it. <laughs> like it they'd see a young black man walking at 3 in the morning and in a nice neighborhood. They wanted to know all about who he was. So once they got to know him, though, well, everything was fine. But eventually, luckily, his landlord realized what was going on and said, tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to loan you some money so you can ride the streetcar. And from that point on, he rode the streetcar. He did the streetcar to uh, school each day. And uh, eventually, he got a job driving a carriage in the area of the uh, Chase Park Plaza Hotel. Familiar with that? Up in the Central West End, and he uh, he drove a carriage up there and made enough money to pay back to get what the guy had loaned him and all. And so uh, good about that. Then he came. Oh, sorry, he came back to Lebanon and uh, eventually uh, moved to Springfield, where he worked for the Crystal, I believe, the Crystal Railroad. Um, from Springfield, he went to Tulsa with Frisco. Uh, then he went to, to a seminary in Georgia. He had made up his mind he was going to be a missionary. There was a new country starting up in Africa, uh, Liberia, and it was mostly American slaves. And the people said, you know, if you want to go back, we'll pay your way. And now they kind of look on that as a put down, you know, well, get out of here, we don't want you here. That wasn't it at all. These were very charitable people who were saying, if you want to go back, we're going to help you. And they didn't force anybody, they offered. And so a lot of uh, blacks went back to Liberia and uh, started their new country. And he wanted to go there as a missionary. Um, he went, after he graduated, they gave him a box of tools, a toolbox full of tools, and said, you know, this is symbolic. You know, you're gonna go out and, and build new things in this world. <coughs> Those tools went to Arkansas and worked as a carpenter got money together, and then uh, came back to Lebanon for a while where he got the idea, they're going to have a World's Fair in St. Louis. And he went up there in 1904 hoping to meet somebody from Africa so he could figure out how to get there. And he did. And uh, they suggested that he go to a steamship company and ask to work for them. And he, he would not only get to go, but he'd get paid. Go. So smart guy. And um, so he, he had graduated from seminary. He had he got all his paperwork from the State Department. He got this job aboard ship. And away he went on his way to Africa. And just when everything looked like it was going to be really good, somebody stole a suitcase. Somebody on the ship. And it had his diploma. It had his passport. It had everything he needed to start his new life. But he went on. He went to Monrovia and uh, Kind of tried to figure out where he was needed, and he went out um, into the bush 
and he found a community out there where they had no church and no school, so that's what he started there. And uh, he was very successful in the short time that he was there, but uh, he was out fishing on a lake, providing food for the school and the families there in the village. And a big storm blew up, the boat capsized, and he was drowned. But in his short life, it was a wonderful life. And I, I just wanted to read something. I got a question. No, I don't. I mean, go ahead with that, but I've got something I want to ask you about. Okay. Well, go ahead, Don. Ask. There was a gentleman in Lebanon. And his name was Wilson McKinley. We called him Wilson McKinley. His name was actually Canola, like this up here. His daughter was Eunice Winfrey. Do you remember George Winfrey? Yeah, absolutely. At the chair that used to shine the shoes yeah. and stuff. Yeah. But in, in your looking around, sometimes we can't, I've tried to find out why we called him McKinley. The people at Eldridge, see, the, they, that family went to Eldridge, Missouri. Mm -hmm. They called him McKinley. We can't find out why they And he answered to the Lynn Poole, lived in Old Town, at the very edge of the limit. He would come out to the farm every day with him. He he would be with him. We always called him McKinley. But his, actually his name was Canola. Mm -hmm. But I'm, if you ever find out why, what the relation is, I, I'll be in it. I'll keep you in mind for that. I, I just want this one little, sometime at the end of the story, I'll write an author's note. On this one, I wrote, as this book is being composed, our society seems to be inundated with young people who are described by some as delicate snowflakes. These young people today seem to feel entitled to a contented and happy lifestyle, free of struggles and worries. They feel that no one should be allowed to offend them or hurt their feelings. What a lesson William T. Vernon and Jacob Canole uh, yep. had for us. What remarkable human beings they were. Thank God for the gift of people like them. And, and isn't that, I mean, can't you agree with me on that? That uh, no snowflake in, in his attitude. So anyway, let's move on. Easy Eddie and Butch O'Hare. Uh, Easy Eddie O'Hare was an attorney in St. Louis. Butch was his son that he always worried about. Craig Butch would never amount to anything. And uh, Eddie was, uh, let's see, he grew up in the Soulard neighborhood in St. Louis, kind of close to the brewery there. Um, went to St. Louis University where he got his law degree. Met a young woman who was studying nursing there, where she got her degree also. And uh, they were married and Butch was the result, and then they moved eventually from Soulard out to Holly Hills, which is in South St. Louis, and had an especially nice home there from the sound of it, nicer than I thought Holly Hills had. But that's where they lived. That's where, that's where Butch grew up. Now, his dad, Eddie, went to Chicago and other places a lot. He, would, he had clients all over. He had one big client in Chicago, and he used to fly up there to see this client a lot. And sometimes he would let Butch come along with him, which he, Butch loved flying. And uh, the, the, the dad had a friend they called Lucky Lindy, and he uh, was the pilot that they could get you ride with. And even uh, when Butch was a little guy, Lindbergh let him take a turn and control us, you know. But he was hooked on flying for sure. Well, anyway, uh, Eddie's big client up in Chicago was a guy named Al Capone. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was Al Capone's tax attorney. Mm -hmm. And so at some point, he wanted out. He felt like this was there was no future in this for him or his family. <coughs> Things could only get worse. And so he went to um, the federal authorities and said, I can give you what you want to know about Al Capone. You can put him in prison. That's what I can turn over to you. But I'm not going to do it just for free. I want you to guarantee me that my son can go to a military academy and get his wings. His choice is Annapolis. 
and they didn't have to think long about it. So okay. So Bush went to Annapolis, uh, became a midshipman, went to uh, got became an ensign, went to um, Pensacola where he learned to fly. And all this was just as World War II was breaking out. And he was sent out, I believe, to the Lexington. Yeah, it was. He was sent to the, to the aircraft carrier Lexington. And this is a picture of him there. And he, he was a, an amazing pilot. One day, the other planes were gone on a mission. And he was the only one there, apparently, because when, they, when the Lexington was attacked by Japanese planes, Butch O'Hare caught them off all by himself, single handed And other people on the plane, including a lot of, on the ship, including a lot of aviators, said they'd never seen flying like that. So he was uh, a true hero at the beginning of the war when we really needed heroes. Mm -hmm. And he was a Medal of Honor recipient. They brought him here. back to the States for the destination. He might have uh, shot down, he came in ace and shot down several planes that day. Might have uh, shot down a lot more. They brought him back to tour America uh, selling war bonds and a big frame for him everywhere he went. But most people have never heard of Butch O'Hare, except the name O'Hare for O'Hare Airport. <coughs> and there's a plaque up there in the airport that said, named in honor of Edward Butch O'Hare, our native son. Never lived a day of his life in Chicago. <laughs> Visited there. You know, going up to see Al Capone, they wouldn't mention that either. <laughs> 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 Or she didn't mention what happened to his dad. Oh, yeah. Well, oh, you turn state's evidence on Al Capone, what do you expect? Uh, it wasn't too long after that. His home was in prison already. But Easy Eddie was walking down the sidewalk with a shotgun from behind mm -hmm. and uh, several, several shots. So he was killed. Um, John Coulter is from up, well, I don't know exactly where he's from, Kentucky, maybe. I think Lewis and Clark picked him up. And in St. Charles, when they were still getting organized and ready to leave, but he turned out to be one of the main guys on their expedition. And uh, as they were going upstream, they were only out of St. Charles a few days when he saw this area that really impressed him. He really liked it. And it's where New Haven, Missouri is now. And he thought, if I ever settle down, this would be the place. Well, that's what happened. He, he did settle down there. It took him to say twice. He had a lot of children. And every year they still have big uh, John Coulter reunions there. And there's a John Coulter Museum and all that stuff. But away from there, most people don't know of John Coulter. Uh, there was a time, well, Lewis and Clark sent him to explore the Yellowstone River. And so he did. And he came back and he told everybody, you got to see what's up there. I mean, the ground shakes. Uh, there are, you walk along and also there's steam comes shooting up out of the ground at you. There are, the ground is red in some places, it's yellow, it's green, it's blue. I mean, you, and they didn't like them, you know. And uh, they said, well, if it's hot water and steam and all this other kinds of sound more like hell than any place you ever heard of. And so the place came to be called Coulter's Hell. Now, you haven't heard of that because it became our first national park, and they changed the name back to the Indian's name of Yellowstone. And anyway, he was. Uh, a really, a really neat guy and a forgotten hero, unless you're around New Haven. <clears throat> Moses Austin, I bet a lot of you know about Moses, lived over at Potosi. He started the city of Potosi and Herculane and some other places too. Uh, he was a wheeler dealer. He made things happen. Wealthy, very wealthy man. Uh, his son Stephen was a Missouri State representative. They ran a general store. Uh, it was they were known for their fairness in dealing with people in their general store. Uh, but one day, it's hard to imagine, he, he just got in his head, he took a horse, he took another man with him, and another pack horse, and off they went through the Ozarks, down across the short grass prairies, and across the desert, and they went to uh, the capital of Mexico, which I believe it was a territorial capital at Monterey. I don't think it went all the way to Mexico City. But can you imagine today you're in maybe Calgary, Alberta, or some Yellowstone in the Yukon or something, different country, small town, and you, well, Calgary's not. Anyway, 
let's say you, you come from a small town in a different country and you just take off on your own one day and you move to Washington, D.C. and say, well, I want to talk to the president. It's hard to imagine, but he got to. He spoke with the, with the president there, Mexican president, mm -hmm. and he said, you're having a real problem with this place called Tejas. I know you are. Uh, don't have enough soldiers to deal with the Indians that are hostile. And uh, he said, I'm from Missouri. It's a mining area. And he said, I can bring a lot of lead mining families and iron mining families here. Said, These people are tough. They're settlers and they know, you know, they know how to take care of themselves. And you won't have to worry about the hostile Indians anymore. We'll take care of them. And uh, so anyway, they said, no, we're not interested in that. And I sent him on back home. On the way home, two things happened. One, he got real sick. Another is that uh, the messenger caught up with him and said, uh, you know, the president changed his mind. And you, you are welcome to bring people in. And so they went to Tejas, which of course we call Texas. But he didn't get to go. Because when he got home, he was so sick that he died. So in those days, if you had something lined up, a business deal of some kind, and you died, your oldest son had to take care of it, or maybe your sons. Well, Stephen uh, was the guy who was in line then to take care of it. And so Stephen Austin became the father of Texas. Maybe it should have been Moses Austin, or at least the two of them together. Mm -hmm. but, Anyway, Austin, Texas was named for him. There's a big statue of him and all. And they're Missourians, and uh, sometimes we forget that. John Wesley Donaldson's a character. Uh, he was a baseball pitcher from Glasgow, Missouri. And he struck out over 5,000 batters in his professional career. Now, this was the Negro leagues, right? Uh, he. Uh, Every team he was on, he was on some good ones, like the Kansas City Monarchs. He was on the, like, the best teams available. Uh, but every team he was on, they had trouble deciding what to do with him. He was always a pitcher. There was no pitcher better. Uh, Buck O'Neill, I talked to Buck O'Neill's grandson, and he said, my dad and my grandpa told me that John Wesley was the best player he ever saw. But anyway, every team he was on, they wanted him to bat leadoff because that way he'd be on base for the next hitters, and he was always the fastest man on the team, so he naturally hit him the leadoff. But the trouble was, he was always the best hitter on the team, so they wanted to have him bat cleanup. And it was just, you know, he was so good, it's hard to imagine. And in all the years that he played, and there were a lot of years, he was never known to have said, said a curse word. Never known to have taken even a sip of alcohol. Um, what else? He never known to have argued with an umpire. Never known to have had a disagreement with a teammate or anybody else in baseball. He was just a gentleman's gentleman, just as neat as could be. And shortly after my book came out, I mean like two weeks later, this guy from Minnesota called and said, I understand you've written about John Wesley Donaldson. And so we talked about it. And he said, I'd like you to nominate him for the uh, Missouri Sports Hall of Fame. And it's in Springfield, of course. And I said, well, you know, I know that you're, there are other researchers, because I've read the research. They've done a lot more, you know, they know more all the statistics that I don't know about. He said, my, my idea about writing about Donaldson was, I was hoping high school kids would read this book. And I just thought he was a great role model. And the guy says, that's what I want you to tell him. So I did. And the following May, I got that's when I got to meet Buck O'Neill's grandson and a bunch of us at the at the table the day that John Wesley Donaldson was inducted into the sports hall of fame. Missouri Sports Hall. Now we're going for Cooper's town next. And hopefully that's getting hard to do because of the time. Um, when he figured, well, Jackie Robinson was taken. Uh, from the Monarchs to the Brooklyn Dodgers. And when that happened, Donaldson saw this is the end of the Negro Leagues. If they're going to bring, bring these big name players out of our league, people are going to go watch them instead of us. And so he was smart about it. He had that figured out. 
and he got a job with the Chicago White Sox. He was a scout, and he brought a huge number of really good black and Latino ball players into the big leagues. And uh, finally, he got to a point. He said, "I got these three more players that I have," them. and they said, "You know, I think we've really got enough black players." So. Um, we're not interested anymore. I said, but these guys are good. There's this Ernie Banks and Hank Aaron. And there's another, anyway, another one, the name just as big as that. Uh, and, and the Chicago White Sox, White Sox said no. You know, well, of course, Ernie Banks came to Chicago and Hank Aaron, the all kind of homeland king, and all this. You know, anyway, uh, he said, well, my time's up. You know, they, they don't value my opinion anymore. So he, he left. And he didn't do well financially after that. He was buried in a grave with no marker at any time. And uh, luckily, someone contacted the White Sox and said, you know, this guy, as great as he was, he's in an unmarked grave. And so they gave him a real nice stone by the one that came up. But better than that, Glasgow, Missouri, had forgotten about it. He grew up there. I mean, he, he was born there and grew up there, and they forgot him. And uh, of course, he wasn't allowed to play on their baseball team, I think. Um, so, what's that, a year ago, July, I went up to the uh, ceremony to open up the new baseball field, and it was the John Wesley Donaldson baseball field for the high school. And as you come up to the field, there's a concession stand there and about a nine or ten foot bronze statue of John Wesley Donaldson. And it's a copy of the one that's in the Negro League Hall of Fame. So he, he just, a, you know, a great role model, a great guy. Uh, Jane Froman was from Independence, no, from University City originally, and uh, eventually lived over closer to Columbia in mid uh, a mu um, music producer was one time asked, who do you think are the 10 best female singers? And he said, that's pretty easy. There's Jane Froman <laughs> and nine others. <laughs> so, and, and she was extremely, extremely good. But she came from a very difficult childhood. Her parents fought constantly, apparently. And she developed this terrible stutter. She found out that when she when she was singing, she didn't stutter. So she sang, and she was good. And uh, But she wasn't just talented, she had a heart. And when World War II broke out, she said, I want to go entertain the troops. And they said, well, OK, we can set up some USO shows for you. Well, now, you know, I'm talking about Europe, or the Pacific, if you want. They said, no, 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 we don't send women there. So. Uh, you can do some of the maybe have a little bit wood or have a or whatever. And um, she said, No, I'll go entertain the troops that are doing the fighting. And they kept saying no. So she joined the Red Cross and was sent to Europe with them. And uh, as she was flying into Portugal, her plane crashed, crashed into the water. She just traded seats with the woman. That woman was killed. Jane survived it, but she lost the use of her legs. Mm -hmm. And she figured out a way to get a, like a bar stool, sort of a, a big stool with wheels on the bottom. Mm -hmm. And she'd wear a long dress and she'd sit on the bar stool and she would sing her songs. And these soldiers or whoever was in the show would come and dance with her, just wheeling her around the stage. And all that. But they weren't fooling anybody. All the soldiers knew that she had. She was like them. She had lost. She lost something also. She lost the use of two things. And uh, anyway, she was a huge hit. And then uh, when her career ended, she came back to Mid Missouri. She opened a camp for uh, music students, especially vocals, up in Mid Missouri. And uh, she encouraged people to come to the camp. And she she taught many people how to sing and how to get into show business, all the tricks. Uh, if you ever get a chance on Turner Classic Movies or Late Night TV, whatever, they often show this show, a movie called uh, With a Song in Her Heart, or With a Song in My Heart. 
and it's the Jane Cromwell story. And it's pretty accurate. Rita Hayworth stars. It's pretty accurate show. Okay, Orion Perseus Howe was 12 <laughs> years old when he joined the Union Army. Uh, his brother was 10. Uh, their father was a bandmaster. And he was in charge of the regimental band, and he just brought his boys along. With him. They were actually in the army. They, they were joined up uniformed soldiers. They dad was bandmaster, so they were drummer boys. Now that doesn't sound like much, maybe, but his unit marched over four thousand miles, and he didn't just march. You know, I mean, the drums as they marched. So you know, he he earned his credits, and um, he was really into it too. His dad. Uh, his time, Dad's time was up. Dad left, but Opie stayed. Orion Percy, so uh, Opie stayed, and uh, he was still in the in the service all through the war. And at the Battle of Vicksburg, which was wow, Missourians fighting Missourians, if it ever was, both sides. But he was on the northern side, of course, and he, his unit was out on the right flank. And they had some guns that used only 54 caliber ammunition, which was kind of unusual, I think. But they were running out. And they realized if they, uh, General Marmon or something was his name, or Colonel Marmon, said, um, not, well, whatever it was, said, if we run out, they're going to overrun us. Mm -hmm. So we can't run out. We have to hold out against them. And so he sent Opie. Opie was busy right at the time. Opie was out crawling among the corpses on the battlefield, taking 54 caliber ammunition back to the guys. Right? This guy, he earned whatever he got. He was a little guy. But he was cool. And uh, anyway, the colonel got him and said, I want you to go find Jim Sherman, tell him what the situation is. We're about to be overrun. We're okay, except that we're out of ammunition. Tell him you have to have 54 caliber ammunition. And so Opie went running across the battlefield to find General Sherman. What he didn't know was five other guys were sent on the same mission. Nobody was sure any of them would make it. The other five were all shot and killed. Opie was shot. He went down, but he got up and struggled on. And he found General Sherman, told him what the situation was. And General Sherman said, Let me get you to the hospital. He said, I can get there. He said, You Get, get some ammunition to my guys, you know. And as he left, he turned around and said, 54 caliber, sir, nothing else will do. I mean, he just wouldn't give it up. Right to the end. So anyway, he, he earned the Medal of Honor. 12 years old, earned the Medal of Honor. And uh, afterwards, after the war, um, General Sherman, General Marmont, and Abraham Lincoln himself all wrote letters of recommendation for OP to go to West Point. West Point wouldn't have it. He said, he's just too little. He just can't do the stuff we do. Navy Academy, Naval Academy said, we'll take him. But he didn't really like that. And he ended up working in the Merchant Marine the first time out on the ocean, the ship sank. And uh, he decided he didn't manage to swim back. Decided that wasn't for him after all. I uh, went to his brother's black or not black shop, harness making shop, worked making harnesses and saddles. Didn't like that. So he decided he was going to go to school, learn to be a dentist, which he did. As soon as he finished, he went to Springfield, Missouri, and down on South Kimbrough set up in his home, a dental shop. Now, these Medal of Honor recipients were guys who would think outside the box. They were people who just, you know, they, they were extraordinary in their thought processes, very daring. And he did something when he got there at Springfield that got him a lot of notoriety. It got him in the papers, a big argument about him, because he was working in his shop with a window facing Kimbrough, and this man walked by and saw the person who was in his dental chair. And he said, that's the guy that's been canoodling with my wife. <laughs> and he came in and started beating on him. And so Opie helped him to ran him out, but he came back with a gun and he came in shooting. And uh, the patient scrambled to the floor and got out of the way. 
that Obi grabbed the gun from his uh, drawer there in his office and killed the guy. And so the question came up about, you know, we understand killing someone to defend yourself or to defend your family or even your home or property, but your office or your patients, is that, is that legal? Is that ethical? And the guy was saying, yeah, that's what the public decided to mm -hmm. in the courts. And anyway, so he was, uh, you know, he didn't have any problems actually resulting from that. Uh, let's see. I told you all those things. Okay, Waldo M. Waldo Hattler from down. He was born in Baltimore. And when he was just three, they moved to the Yosho. And that was the first time he ran away from home. And he was three years old. My friends are in Baltimore. I don't have any friends in Yosho. I'm going to Baltimore. And took it off down the road. Of course, someone saw him and brought him back. And uh, but he was he was a guy that hit the road all through his life, and um, his dad was a banker, and he wanted his son Waldo to be uh, a, a lawyer, and so he prom he promised Waldo promised his dad that he would become a lawyer, which he did. Now he was a really good student. He was a star football player. He was just an all around good guy. But his hobby, which he did all his life, was to ride the rails. So a little rich kid, but in the old steam locomotives, you know, they had the cow catcher on the front. His favorite place was to sit behind the cow catcher where he could see the world going by. And he rode all over the country like that. Uh, even when he was in law school, he'd take off every chance he got and jump on a train somewhere. Um, he traveled all around. Um, and when I Tell this, people think, oh, he's you know goofball. He was not. He was a very high achiever. That's just what he did for fun. Uh, he stopped during the Great Depression. He said it was a different crowd riding the rails then. It wasn't the same. And uh, to tell you what kind of a guy he was, even before he went in the military, um, he was in his dad's bank one time, and these three men came in and robbed the bank. And he grabbed a gun and chased him out. And he kept on chasing him. He ran out of ammunition and he stopped at different places where he knew the people and borrowed their guns. And he kept chasing. Them. He finally caught up with them. And he brought them back in, turned them over to the sheriff, they locked him up and locked them up. And then he told them, you know what? This gun was empty. <laughs> he brought three guys in with an empty gun. Well, he didn't know that, did he? But when he uh, was in World War I, there was a particular place while the unit was in France. The Germans were heavily encamped on one side of the river. They had to get across the river. It was icy cold. They had to get across. So he and five other guys, six maybe, swam across the river carrying ropes. The idea was to tie a rope on the other side and then get back and tell everybody it was all set, and then they would all grab that rope, they would get across the river and not get swept down the stream. Well, they, of course, made noise. There was some light at night, and they were seen as they came across the river. The other guys were bludgeoned to death or maybe shot or bayoneted or whatever when they got to the German side of the river. But Hackler made it, and his rope was the key for his unit getting across. And they did push the Germans back. They won a big victory and all, largely because of him and his daring and his physical prowess. Um, oh, he uh, prospered during the Great Depression. He made fortunes and lost them. Mm. Yeah, he was, he's always a real good dealer. But uh, he traveled um, with uh, his wife and even after he had a terrible stroke, he went back to the battlefield and, you know, to visit it. No. You know, one more thing. When I was researching this, uh, COVID was on, I didn't get to talk to many people, but no one in the Osho ever heard of it. And isn't that a shame? Mm -hmm. Especially since the Osho's VFW is 
the Hatler VFW. It's on Hatler Drive. <laughs> but people do recognize the name. And I found that with, uh, I think there's 76 guys in that Medal of Honor, 76 Missourians. And I found that wherever I went. Basically, they had been forgotten. And that's a crying shame. Uh, I'm going to hurry here. John Barry Meacham was a uh, controversial guy. He, uh, worked, he was a slave in uh, Kentucky. His owner said, if you will do what I expect you to do, and then you have free time, you can do whatever you want to do, earn money or whatever, in free time. And he, he knew how to make barrels. So he made barrels. He was a cooper. And uh, he eventually, he was so good, he, he was in demand. And he, he eventually earned enough money that he could uh, buy his freedom, which he did. So next he wanted to buy his family's freedom. He had a wife and some children in another plantation. But they had moved to St. Louis. And that's how he came to St. Louis. He followed them. And when he got there, he found everything was perfect for him. They had a steamboat, sometimes 72 steamboats at a time, tied up at the St. Louis levee. And in those days, everything traveled in barrels. Pickles and crackers and salt and oatmeal, whatever. And they, you know, could turn it up on its edge and roll it. And, and uh, <coughs> they, they could move large quantities quickly in barrels. Barrels were in demand. And he was good. And he, he realized that and found that out and made, he made money. And so he soon bought his wife and children's freedom. And then uh, he started, his business was getting so big, he needed help. This is where he got controversial. He started buying slaves. Now, he told the slaves, if you work for me long enough that you can uh, get a rudimentary education and learn a job, then You'll be able to make your way in the world and nobody's going to cheat you. So, especially math and a good trade. And once they did that, he, got, he gave lots of people their freedom. Lots. And uh, then he got into, uh, there was a rule of the navigation that if a steamboat sank, first person on the scene who could raise that steamboat, it was theirs. And they got the contents and they got the boat itself. Well, he started salvaging steamboats got that content, which you could sell real quickly, because they were all sealed up nice in barrels, right? And then uh, he would plug up the patch, patch up the steamboat, and all of a sudden he owned a steamboat. And he started a steamboat line. Well, he needed a lot of people to work for him now. He started buying more slaves. And uh, it, he just had so many people that he set free. And <coughs> there was a time, you know, he, I said he wanted them to have a rudiment, rudimentary education. Um, he started a school for black people in St. Louis, and that went on for a while, but then somebody spilled the beans, and the authorities came and knocked on the door and said, John, you can't do this. Uh, this is not legal here. So he wouldn't take no for an answer. He had a steamboat. He said in the morning, instead of meeting at the schoolhouse, meet the steamboat. They went out uh, halfway across the river and said they were in Illinois now, and off the lessons. And I mean, he was just a, a neat kind of a guy. Controversial, but uh, forgotten, and I think that's a shame. Phoebe Apperson Hurst was a lady from Franklin <coughs> County, a school teacher in a dirt floor log school. Um, she <coughs> married George Hurst, who was home because his mother was ill. He had gone to the Franklin County School of Mines there. Franklin County, and uh, then he went west looking for gold or silver, found copper, and then later found gold and silver, but came fabulously wealthy. But when he came home to visit his mom, met Phoebe, and they were married and lived together all their lives, and uh, she became sort of a, uh, a model for behavior in the Gilded Age, and uh, Talk about Victorian times. She was the American. By the way, if you want a fundraiser for your Victorian law, maybe people would pay for you not to dance. Oh. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 
Who's the thought? I never said it. While she was still in Missouri, she started a group called the Congress of Parents, which became the Parent Teacher Association. And uh, that was replaced later in a lot of school kind of teacher organizations. But anyway, she was the one that started all that. And uh, she is helped to design this house for her family that became a state park in California called the Hearst Mansion, the Hearst Castle. That's right. And uh, she never got to live there, though. She didn't. But she also endowed so many projects in archaeology, so many universities. <coughs> Uh, St. Clair, Missouri, the kids who graduate from high school there every year compete for the Phoebe Epperson Hearst College Scholarship. She uh, didn't forget her roots. Um, White Hair was a, a really neat Indian chief. I'm going to try to go fast. He, uh, in, in the Osage language, was a husky. And he was so famous among his people that, you know how Julius Caesar uh, was Julius Caesar. But then after him, everybody wanted to be Caesar. So there was Caesar Augustus, and you know, Caesar this, Caesar that. Well, a lot of those age chiefs since then have been Protestants. And he he got his fame among his people fighting the British, the Redcoats. And when he was a young warrior, he got one of the British officers down, grabbed the guy's hair, grabbed his scalping knife, and just then the guy who had been unconscious came too. White hair thought he was dead, and but he came to, and he jumped up and screamed and ran away, and left him holding the guy's white hair. He powdered wig. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. right? And the Osage said, "Wow, that thing's got strong medicine. Mm -hmm. yeah, it saved its owner's lives, you know, mm -hmm. and and brought him back from the dead, maybe. But, but now, well, has it, so he changed his name to White Hair. He had white hair." Um, and he was a, a really good leader too. And Paul Husker, Oklahoma is named for him. But um, he had a son, young white hair, who was very ambitious. Uh, he had another son they called No Ears. Uh, and I told you wrong. White, young white hair was not ambitious. It was No Ears, so ambitious. Young white hair became the next chief, but No Ears wanted that position. So he got this idea about, and this is all well documented because of Fort Osage, the soldiers and Mary Easton Sibley and those who were George Sibley who were at Fort Osage wrote about these people a lot. And um, he, he would go, um, this no ears character, would go around to anyone who would support him and give him gifts, trying to buy their friendship basically, buy their support. And when he ran out of things to give, he took from other people and gave them. Redistribution of wealth, right? Yeah, he, he was one who came up with that on his own. But anyway, interesting interesting characters. Uh, I'm going to go kind of fast. Paul Hennings from near Independence, Missouri. He married young woman Ruth from Tuscumbia. And they... Uh, lived in Kansas City. They both worked at KCMO. That's where he met her. And they were talented people. They were on-air personalities. They often sang and, and played music because that's what radio stations did. A lot of live music. But Paul wanted to be in uh, show business. He wanted to be in, in the movies. And what he wanted to do in the movies was write the movies. He wanted to be a screenwriter. Uh, now, Ruth told him about her life in, Colum in Tuscumbia. She also told him about, in the summers, she and these two good-looking cous cousins of hers would go to Eldon, and they would work at the Burris Hotel that their aunt and uncle were in. And it was right by the railroad tracks, and all these people would stop in there, you know, salesmen or railroad workers, whatever, a lot of times very interesting characters, and she just had a great time working there. She loved working at the hotel by the tracks in Eldon, and he took that, that information that she gave him, and he put it into some stories. By the way, he'd been writing for Peter McGee and Molly and Red Scott and all kinds of people up until that point. He was, he was a good writer, 
but now he's wanting to go on his own. So he took that information, put it into a story, which he called Teddy Go Junction. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, uh, and the young lady here on the left with the red hair, that's Paul and Ruth's daughter. And uh, he also remembered his uh, Boy Scout days down around Branson and all the characters he met down there. And so he took some of those stories and put a lot of uh, the with it, of course, and created the Beverly Hillbillies. And Paul even wrote The Ballad of Jed Clinton. And then uh, he always wanted to come back to the farm in Missouri. And in fact, and he wasn't, no, no, he was, I guess he grew up on the farm. He was near it, then. wasn't a prominent thing, but near it. Uh, people who met him said, once you once you've met Paul Henning, you've met a genuine Missouri farm boy. Mm -hmm. And that's what he always wanted to be. Uh, so he met at this story about a guy who was very successful, wanted to go back to the farm, but his wife didn't really want to go. Ruth would have been fine that, really. But in the story, the wife didn't want to go. So uh, uh, she probably was okay since they had Jaw Jaw the board to play the wife. <laughs> anyway, that uh, became uh, Green Acres. That? Green Green Acres. Acres. So, um, in any way, he also invented something where the people from one show would meet people from another <coughs> show, right? So there's a Green Acres crew at the Petticoat Junction Hotel, and that they nobody thought that was a good idea. People loved it. So, anyway, by the way, Paul and Ruth and have given us our newest state park, right? Paul and Ruth Henning State Park down by Branson. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to go fast here. Well, I get to talk about in third history. But uh, Tom Akers was the, he grew up at Eminence, Missouri. He was the high school principal there. And one day some recruiters came in to talk to the kids about maybe joining the Air Force. And um, who knows, you might even get to go into space. And so they talked to all the kids, and I, I don't know if any of the kids were listening, but he was. And first thing you know, he's um, an astronaut. And he had several missions into space. Uh, he went to, uh, went to school at Eminence, went to college at Raleigh University, Science and Technology, which was School of Mines there. Uh, Linda Godwin was from Carthage. Right by Cape Girardeau, another small town. And she went to school there at Carthage, graduated from high school, went on to Southeast Missouri State, and uh, went into the astronaut program, had several space missions, and she now teaches at Mizzou. And I got to meet her the other day. She's a very, very nice lady. Got a new book out. She was out, out talking that book. Um, and then Janet Cavandi is from Carthage and over by Joplin, of course. And is that what I said? I, I got mixed up in a bit. Yeah, I think you did. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sorry. Well, she's yeah, from sure. Jackson, Missouri. Yeah. Jackson. Okay. Yeah. And then Carthage by uh, Joplin. Doris and I met some people who went to school with her, and they said when she was in high school, she was called the Queen of the Geeks because she was. So pretty and so intelligent and such a high achiever, all the boys were intimidated. Of course, when you get to college, that changes, right? There are a lot of pretty girls there who are also intelligent and awesome. Um, anyway, she went to hmm, uh, Jackson, I mean, Carthage High School, went to Southern Missouri State College, and then I think went from there to either Mizzou or Rolla. Anyway, see a pattern here? These are small town people who went to small town high schools, who went to state universities, not the big private, you know, Harvards and Yales and Ivy League stuff, and all had wonderful careers. Um, Michael Hopkins, he was born, where was that? Lebanon, Missouri. And Michael born the hospital here in Lebanon, and that was because there was a hospital here in Lebanon. He wasn't really didn't live here, lived over by Richmond on a farm. His mom was a teacher at school of the uh, 
uh, school of the Osage, Osage Beach. And so he went to school there, and that's where he graduated. And then went to school, I believe, at Raw. But again, a small town guy, uh, public school, public universities. And the exception to the rule is, is Bob uh, Bencom, who was from University City, which is not a small town. And, oh, you know what? Michael Hopkins went to the University of Illinois. He got a, he got a big scholarship there as a quarterback. Uh, uh, but Benkin was from University City, and he also uh, had a great career with NASA. But then he joined the SpaceX Corporation, and he's the number one guy. He's the one that runs the show uh, because they're launching all these new missions all the time. And uh, so anyway, we had five astronauts, very successful astronauts from Missouri. Um, several of them came back to Missouri after their astronaut days were ended and, uh, you know, teach at Rolla or Mizzou or something like that. So we think, well, we've forgotten about all these heroes because now they were so long ago. Mm -hmm. We're forgetting about them right now. Our kids and grandkids may remember them better than we So we just kind of need to be tuned into that sort of a thing in the world too. Um, so this is the time. Taking more time than I wanted, but I'd be happy to answer any questions. A short story almost though about that. Baker finished his career with Rob in the Air Force program. <laughs> My youngest son couldn't get in the Air Force Academy. Yeah, he went to Rob at school and began to what do you call it, the reserve officer training. We went in this office to see this man. And I don't know why, it didn't dawn on me. It, it was very nice. And there was actually, I got to think, there was a picture of one of the space shuttles on his wall. And all I could think of, I don't know how, at one time, the University of Texas had a coach named Baker. And that was all I could think of. So later, when we got out and came home, and I thought, it hit me then. But that's the, that was the answer now. That, thank you for telling that story because that makes my point that we're forgetting these people. We're yeah. mm -hmm. living out here among us sometimes. Sure. <coughs> we, we tend to forget these great heroes. And, uh, and you know what? Was he a pretty nice guy? Out there? Yeah, he really was. Um, I don't think he'd be principal down at the 10 minutes for very long without being a pretty nice guy. <laughs> well, you, know, that, that, you have to close the dear teeth. <laughs> Did you know that? No. And then it's high school closes. Oh, for deer season. Yeah, deer season. yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I, I heard the high school boy down there, what are the four seasons? He said, well, I heard the season. Any other questions? All right, then I'm going to keep one more thing before we. Ross, there is. I was, I was going to ask oh, you. I'm sorry. Yeah, sure. Your stories have really inspired me to think about helping kids who have a lack of grit or mm -hmm. don't have that resilience. Have you ever used local <clears throat> history or his heroes to, to kind of break that connection with kids to say, hey, you can overcome your shortcomings, your, your challenges. I'm just thinking to myself, you know, what can we do to help some of these kids that are dealing with life challenges? And I don't know if you, as a teacher, do you use parables and stories to, to maybe bring those kids out of their shell? To be honest, that's how I got started writing Forgotten Heroes. Uh, okay, I I used to, you know, I was supposed to ask my kids each year to write about Missouri heroes. Mm -hmm. Well, they one of the first things they do would be go to the web page, state web page, and let's see who's on there. Well, there's one who was a stripper, um, <laughs> called her an exotic dancer, but kids know what that. Sure. This isn't the old days. They know exactly what that means. And uh, there were just different ones. I thought we can do better than this. Mm -hmm. And so I, that's why the book. And it's in a lot of high schools. And uh, it's a. I, I hoped it would be a source for librarians. If somebody came in and said, "I'm supposed to do a story about some famous Missourian," I don't know. What, you know and librarians, 
It started at the homeschool convention, right? When that's was... right. That's right. That really got started at a homeschool convention because they do a lot of that sort of thing. I mean, just right before this meeting, I was in another meeting where we were trying to brainstorm ways to connect with these kids that are having some real trust struggles. And, that, you know, this has got me thinking maybe, I don't know, pairing up some teachers that care with with kids that want to hear about overcoming challenges. Ross, could you mention about John Wesley Donaldson, how he could have been in the... Well, I didn't. No, I didn't tell that. But uh, not Tug McGraw. John McGraw, I think, was owned the Brooklyn team. Or, no, he owned the New York Giants. Anyway, he saw John Wesley Donaldson play. Well, I want that guy on my team. But blacks were not allowed in the major leagues at that time. So he approached John and said, here's what I want you to do. Go to Cuba, play ball there, and I'll draft you as a Cuban. Right? And Donaldson said, well, I'll sort of have to uh, forsake my family and my heritage and all that, right? Now, I'm not in, you know, a man of real integrity. And uh, now they're, they're all kind of, um, there was a, well, I just won't go into it. I've taken too much time. But, but I really think there are a lot of really good role models. Who, um, Steve McQueen. Oh, my gosh. He, uh, but, um, what? Is it Marshall? Uh, hi, Marshall. Mm -hmm. um, it's a little town. Anyway. He, Starts with the next. Steve, what? Yeah. F Steve McQueen had a terrible life. He also was from a terrible. His mother kept marrying wife beaters. Yeah. Steve McQueen was always in the way. And the Slater was the name of the town. Slater, yeah. And he went up there and lived with his grandparents. And those were the happiest times in his life. And he, um, he they had an old motorcycle out in the barn. He learned to ride the motorcycle up there. He used that skill later. And, um, but he had you know all these things going on. But he, when his time in Missouri with these good grandparents who loved him and cared for him, and had the opportunities for him. Uh, the the uh, teachers at Slater, several have told us that he was not a very good student. But they found out after he was gone that he was deaf in one ear and had really bad hearing in the other ear. And that probably from his beatings that he took, you know, from his stepdads. But uh, anyway, he, he was a good story. He went on to Los Angeles, he, he was quirky out there. They all thought this guy's kind of a nutball because even though he's in demand and he could get these big contracts to do movies, he, he would always have stuff in there about, um, you know, along with my salary, I want two truckloads of blue jeans. I want uh, so much, uh, I don't know, whatever, whatever he put in there. And then they found out later that he was going to this home for troubled boys where he had spent a couple of years. And uh, he, was, he would go over there a lot, not to talk and work out in here, but he would go and shoot pool with them. He'd hang around with them, you know, and teach them uh, that you can overcome these struggles. And uh, yeah, they're, they're all kind of good stories like that. That's good. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a good way to do it. Give the kids stories because they remember stories and give them stories about people they can identify with and emulate. Mm -hmm. so. Yes? Yeah. Okay, well, <laughs> she's telling me my time. She Thank said you. a good job, <laughs> but she really means it. These are the books I, well, I didn't bring all of them, but I, I brought most of these tonight. I brought, brought the ones I thought you'd be interested in. I wanted to mention uh, there are some red squares around some of the books. Those are the ones that have the Cleveland County uh, information or stories. So, all right. Thank you very much. Thank you. And your books are for sale, sir? Yes. Yeah, they're each of them $17, and that includes the Thank you. Thank you.